Hello friends, how are you? My name is Ori Ferger and today I'm going to show you some sources where the Hemingia as a guardian entity is mentioned. Take this as a sort of attachment video of the previous video about the concept of the Hemingia. But take special notice that before you watch this video, please watch the previous one. I shall leave a link down below in the description or in the comment section. Once you understand Hemingia, uh, you will better understand the content of this video. Now, on the previous video, I have explored Hemingia in its sense of luck and a spiritual force which is part of the self. But Hemingia, in some accounts, is also referred to as being a sort of guardian spirit. If you have seen my previous videos about the parts of the self and my development on such subjects, you already know that Hemingia is intimately tied with the concept of the Philigia. So today, let's explore some sagas to understand Hemingia in this sense of being a guardian spirit and not as a guardian angel as some people refer to in a lot of websites throughout the internet uh, including Wikipedia. The guardianship sense within Hemingia isn't the same concept of a guardian angel and in fact in some sagas seems to be closer to the concept of the Valkyrie. But Let's start this video and you will better understand what I'm talking about. Let's start with the concept of the Valkyries, which I have already made a video of, but in this particular video I think it's necessary to talk about Valkyries so we can better understand the concept of the Hemingia as a guardian entity. In Grimnismal, Eleven maidens are presented to us as being female entities who carry wine to the warriors in Valhall, and two others carry the horn of the god Hudan. A total of 13 Valkyries whom Hudan sent to battle to aid him, and they are the ones that dictate who is going to die and who will achieve victory according to Hudan's wishes. These Valkyries carry out Huden's wishes in each battle. And then there are three others, uh, three other Valkyries that choose the slain in battle and rule over the battle, which seem to be the three main Valkyries that control the battlefield while the other 13 bring death and rejoice in the slaughter. Valkyries in various accounts have different physical aspects. In Okor Normal, Valkyries are described as being dignified women on horseback and in full armor. On the other hand, in Daral Daryord, they look fiercer and very crude, weaving the web of battle and completely mad to the point of being absolutely excited with bloodbath and carnage. But whatever their appearance might be, one thing most of them have in common in Old Norse literature they rejoice in slaughter and have a very active presence in the conflicts of mortals. However, and take special notice at this, despite most of the time Valkyries are depicted as supernatural entities, in some accounts they are regarded as being mortal women. For instance, in the poem Helga Kvida Jorvald Sornar, there is a Valkyrie named Svalfa, daughter of King Helimi, who appears in a company of nine maidens to grant young Helgi his name. Despite being mortal, she will act as Hegil's supernatural guardian and protector in the battles to come. In this particular account, she is referred to as Hegil's radiant bride in shining armor, and she isn't a servant of Huden, rather she is attached to the prince throughout the prince's entire life. After Hegil's death comes another Helgi, a Valkyrie named Sigrun, who is the betrothed of Helgi, is said to be the reincarnation of the previous Valkyrie, Svalfa. 
and she too comes to grant Helgi his name. She is mortal and becomes the bride of the prince. Don't forget this account, it will be important further ahead. And, and then we have um, other accounts such as Fofnismo, Helred, Runhildar and the Volsunga saga, where there is a curious mixture between human and supernatural in the concept of the Valkyries. Furthermore, in Volundarkhida and Romundar saga, Valkyries transform themselves in swans. The latter, Romundar saga, the warrior in the saga is protected by a woman in the shape of a swan. So, it seems the Valkyries, in a general panorama, have this idea implicit of guardianship, attending specific warriors, those either being Huden's favorites or the Valkyries themselves favorites. Some Valkyries can shapeshift into animals and become the guardian entity of a warrior. And this leads me to talk about the Filgia. As I've said previously on other videos, the Filgia is regarded as a guardian animal of a person. The closest thing we have to an animal totem in the Old Norse beliefs. The Filia is described as either being a hare, a cat and occasionally a swan. A familiar spirit, companions of witches and sorcerers uh, we often find in European folklore. The Filia often appears in animal form, a spiritual entity whose existence is intimately tied to the existence of its mortal owner. They often appear in dreams and that's how people met their own Filia through dreams. But then, in some sources, we start to have a new conception for the Filgia, that of a guardian spirit in the form of a woman, which is called Fjölkjona. In Alfredar Saga, Alfredar is on his ship and finds a woman ahead clad in a coat of mail, walking over the waves. Immediately, Alfredar knew she was his Fjölkjona his woman Filgia, his guardian and protective spirit. This woman was meant to be the guardian of another, but he refused her and so Helfred accepted her as his Filgia. This is an interesting account because unlike the animal Filgia who dies if the owner dies, the Filgia woman lives on after the death of the man whom she has attended and then she must pass on to someone else. The Filia as an animal spirit is attached to a person since birth, while the Filia as a woman is a guardian that appears in a person's life after she stops being the guardian spirit of another who died and no longer needs guardianship. We have various accounts of these spiritual entities coming in dreams and either presenting themselves as the guardian entities of the person or warning them of, the, of their upcoming fate and death, because thereafter they must move on to another person. Let me give you an example. In Thorstein's saga, Thorstein is visited in a dream by three women who warn him that his thrall is plotting his death. They come to ask him where are they to be sent after he dies, to which he replies to his son Magnus. To which they reply that they will not be the guardians of his son for too long because he too will meet death very soon. On another account, Viga Glum's saga, the word Hemingia is used to describe these guardian spirits. The man Glumr had a dream and in it he met a woman walking outside his homestead, uh, which he then invited to his house. She agreed and entered and he woke up. Glumr understood his dream and this woman to be his grandfather's Hemingia and he must have died and so she came to be his own Hemingia. Those last accounts I gave you 
uh, we have a general picture of supernatural women who are the guardians attached to one particular family. When the man they attended dies, they move on to the next generation if they are accepted. In Viga Grom's saga, as well as other sagas where these guardian women are referred to as Hemingia, they are all described as being huge women in armor, which resembles the physical appearance of the Valkyries, particularly the one in Helgakvida Jorvatsonnar, where the first Valkyrie Svalfa is reborn in the guise of Sigrun and both grant the name to both men they attended, the first Elgi and the second Helgil, presumably a descendant of the first warrior prince. This was exactly where I wanted to get, because if you have seen the, the previous video about the concept of the Emhingia, you know that the general idea is that Hemingia means luck or the good fortune of a person and is said to pass on from generation to generation, particularly if to a person it is given the name of the ancestor, the original owner of the Hemingia, and in this manner acquiring the name of the previous ancestor, a person was not only calling upon the ancestor for aid, but also acquiring the luck inherited within the family, acquiring the Hemingia and the guardian spiritual entity of the family to ensure the continuation of the protection of the family, good fortune and success. We have a clear perception of this in Vertens de la Saga, the expression of this idea that luck Hemingia was believed to pass with the name of someone who had once possessed it. And I quote, the boy shall be called Hingimundr after his mother's father, and I hope for luck, Hemingia, for him on account of the name. But it seems in the sagas that you don't simply choose the name of a father or a grandfather, but of a man of the family who has great renown and honor to pass on those good qualities to the next generation. The same thing as I have explained in the previous video, that Emingia was a force that was passed down from generation to generation, and the greater amount of good Emingia, the better luck, success and good fortune a person has. The Emingia of a man can pass on to someone else when he is dead, can also apparently be lent during his lifetime if it is sufficiently powerful. It is something that can be handed on after death and it usually rema remains within one's family, a force connected with the name, so that if a child is called after the original possessor of the Emingia, the child will inherit it automatically. Emingia as it is used in the sagas and described to us, seems to stand for an abstract conception of something belonging to an outstanding person, which is part character and part personality, but much more than that. A force residing in the individual, a great quality above all other qualities, which attaches itself to certain individuals more than others. Because in other sagas we have cases of people without Hemingia, when men must still acquire it or simply don't have it. And even though being brave men with great qualities, they lack Hemingia and therefore in that aspect they are lesser than other men. And that is why in the previous video I said and continue to reinforce that Hemingia is the total amount of power and illumination a person is in possession of and only some can acquire it. It is a supernatural power that only very powerful people can obtain. The Emingia will make a person victorious and resilient because it empowers the person, because it is a universal power obtained by combining one's qualities and wisdom 
and achieving a higher state of existence. All right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video and please watch the previous one. Uh, if you understand uh, what I have talked about on the previous video about the Heminga as luck and the spiritual force, you will better understand the content of this video. Once again, thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, Takurida.